Now, a few uh, years ago, um, Sainsbury's put up this poster in one of their shop windows. Now, you might not be able to read it. That's the best photo that we can get of it. It says, there's a 50 pence challenge. The challenge is to get customers to spend 50p more than they plan to when they come in store. Now, unfortunately, this poster, which was meant for Sainsbury's employees only and to be put in the staff room, was put on public display in a busy uh, shop window in London. It wasn't put up for very long, but it was quickly taken down and took uh, social media by storm. Um, trying to get customers to spend more money than they actually planned on doing so. And of course, if everybody spent 50p more, then actually, you know, that would be a lot of profit for Sainsbury's. It caused embarrassment. Why? Uh, because they don't want to be known that their tactic was to get us to spend more money than we actually planned on spending. Now, on some level, I suspect we probably all know that businesses operate that way. They want us to spend. They don't put the food out because they love us and they're a charity. They want us to spend money in store. Of course, we know that. But of course, businesses are friendly. They are nice to us. They're chummy. They're pally. In fact, they're very informal now. Perhaps you get emails from businesses that are sort of, hi, so-and-so. They're really sort of chatty. When their websites fail, it says, oopsie, and things like that. They, they want a sort of relationship with us. They don't want it to be sort of transactional. They don't want it to appear that they just want our money. They want us to be friends with us. That's what it sort of appears like. But of course, with this advert, it sort of showed perhaps the real face. They wanted us to spend more money. They didn't want that to be publicly known. Why am I saying this? Well, they got caught out. Their public face was not the same as what perhaps they were like uh, behind closed doors. This, there was a disconnect between the sort of happy, friendly shop face of Sainsbury's and then this poster. One customer said this, as a customer, I don't want to feel like I'm being forced or tricked into spending extra by staff who've been challenged to make me do so. Now, I'm sure if you work for Sainsbury's or know people who do, I'm sure they're lovely people and every shop is like this. But Titus 3 is about how the church ought to relate to the public. You see, so far in Titus, we've seen the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, the truth of the gospel that is to transform lives. Then we've seen the importance of elders, leaders in the church who are to teach that who are to encourage the church in that. We've seen this intergenerational church community living out these truths, encouraging one another, getting alongside one another. And we've seen last week, at the end of chapter 2, that it is all of grace, that God's grace has appeared, bringing salvation. It's to be founded on grace. And now in chapter 3, Paul begins to think about how the church ought to relate to those outside of the church, to those in the public and so a challenge for us is, are we, as a church, a bit like Sainsbury's, where publicly we, we want to sort of bless Old Town and Swindon, but perhaps privately having an attitude towards society, an attitude towards culture and the world that we wouldn't want to be made known? We're going to see uh, three things in our passage uh, this morning. The first is Paul's reminder. Paul's reminder. As we live out our faith in the public sphere... Paul begins by saying the first point of application is in our attitude towards the state, towards the government. Look down at verse 1. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work. This is one of the places in the New Testament that talks about the relationship between the state and the church. Other passages might be Romans 13, there's a bit in 1 Peter that's about this. This was a fairly common teaching uh, in uh, the New Testament. This is not a random idea. You can see that because of the first word in verse 1. Remind them. Uh, Titus already knew this. The church already knew this. When Paul commands Titus here to pass on this message, this is not something new. The church already knew this. They already knew that they were to uh, be obedient. They were to submit to those in authority. Paul and Titus had already told them this when they'd shared the gospel, when they discipled them, when they were on the island of Crete. They knew this already. This is not new information. This is standard Christian teaching. And in fact, the theme of showing respect uh, to those who uh, have authority is a common one in Scripture. Lots of the letters in the New Testament talk about the way that employees are to relate to their boss, or uh, perhaps how people are to relate to those who are in leadership in the church. 
Or you think of the Ten Commandments. The fifth commandment is honour your father and mother. And honour your father and mother isn't just sort of restricted to your relationship with your mum and dad. It's a much broader principle of show respect to those to whom respect is owed and honour to those to whom honour is owed. And Paul says here, remind them of the stuff they already know. They are to be subject to the rulers and to obey those who are in authority over them. Now, naturally, I know what you're thinking. Our minds think, okay, but what does that really mean? Do we have to obey the government in everything? Uh, What does that mean for this? What does that mean for that? Uh, Are there times when it is right for Christians to disobey the state? Um, Now, these are big questions, and we probably won't have time to exhaust all of that this morning, but here's some thoughts. God calls his people, calls all people, to obey those who are in authority to respect those who have authority over us, whether that's the local council or whether that's uh, Boris Johnson and the government. Those people in authority have been put in authority by God. They are accountable to him. They are to rule well and justly, and they are there to help regulate society so that it's not anarchy, so that society, humanity, can flourish, can grow, and they're to raise even taxes, it talks about in some New Testament passages, for that to happen. That's a good thing, God says. Of course, we're never to submit when it leads us to sin. Uh, There's a famous bit in the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament when the state says to the apostles, uh, you are not to tell people about Jesus. And if you know the story, you'll know that they say, no, we're to obey God, not people. Ultimately, of course, all authority in heaven and earth is with God, with his son, Jesus Christ. He is the supreme one to whom we are to obey. And if the government calls us to sin, then we are to resist that, to disobey the government and to obey God. We obey God first and foremost. That's clear. The problem is, is those are grey areas, isn't there? There's loads of grey areas. And I think, if we're being honest, COVID has shown us that. There are lots of grey areas. On the one hand, I think we probably all say, it's good that as a society we obey health and safety laws building regulations. If you've bought a house at any time, I I hope that it's been sort of built in compliance with building regulations. We want that to be the case. We know that there are laws that we want people to obey, health and safety rules. And yet on the one hand, we have that. And yet there are, there have been commands, there have been laws which have made the public worship of God very hard. And where those two things intersect, where those two things come together is really tricky. We have to be honest, there are grey areas and there are tricky things because probably we would all have a difference of opinion on some of those things. It's increasingly difficult because the role of the state in the New Testament is to regulate society, to punish evildoers, Romans 13 says, law and order so that society can flourish, to raise taxes for that purpose. But it doesn't have in the New Testament the idea that the state would have authority over all parts of our lives. The New Testament writers would never have imagined a society, a situation where perhaps the government would perhaps punish the thoughts that we have on moral issues or whether people could say certain things in street evangelism or how we disciple our kids. Now, I'm not making any political point in that. It's just to say there are some things which the government perhaps may make rules and laws over that actually is not for the government to make laws and rules over. And we need to be wise. There are gray areas in this. We need to have wisdom as we think about these things, in the same way that we would say it is not right for church leaders to be able to make rules over all parts of church members' lives. That would be completely inappropriate. There are certain things that God has given to the role of the state, certain things that God has given to the role of church leaders, and certain things that God has given to the role of families. But whilst there are grey areas, ultimately our allegiance is to God, to obey God, not men. And yet, what does verse 1 say? It says we are to be subject to rulers and authorities. We are to obey them, it says. And whilst there may be grey areas, our general disposition, our general attitude to the law, to the government, to rulers, even bad rulers, is to have one of obedience of gentleness, of respect, being peaceable, it says, verse 2. Now, this week, you may have seen that 
this speech from Boris Johnson. Poor old Boris got, his, got himself in a bit of a muddle this week. He got himself in a muddle because he obviously didn't number his pages. And during his speech, he got his page numbers totally out of order. And he was sort of fumbling around and he said, oh, forgive me, forgive me. If you've ever done any public speaking, you will know that terrible feeling. What he needed was one of these books. You have it sort of put the pages in a book, you see, and then you don't get mixed up. But Boris got himself mixed up. And uh, then he had this sort of long, uh, slightly extended illustration about a reference to Peppa Pig and Peppa Pig World. I don't know if you saw that. Um, and it sort of prompted cartoons like this, um, with Peppa saying, why is he dragging me in, into this, and, and all of that. Um, now, the reason I'm saying this is um, it's easy in society to slightly scoff, to slightly mock and deride people, whether that's one political party or another. It's easy to do that. The world around us is full of particularly political discourse that is all about sort of mocking, scoffing, ridiculing opponents, wherever they're on the political spectrum. But verse 2 says, We are to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all people. Now, that's not to say we can't criticise them, it's not even to say that we can't seek to overthrow a bad government even. But it is to say our attitude is to be humble, to be gentle. We should be respectful towards those who are in authority, even if we don't like them, even if we think their laws are bad or they're uh, silly, or even if their laws are incredibly bad, we are still to be respectful, it says. But it's not just to those who are political leaders. It says, verse 2, to speak evil of no one. This is much broader. To show all humility to all people. It's easy to speak badly of people sort of in society, people sort of out there. Perhaps easy to mock those who we look at their lifestyle and think that it's a bad lifestyle. Perhaps we see people who are spending their evenings getting drunk on a Saturday night and we're tempted to sort of mock. Or we scoff and uh, look down at, at teenage girls who are spending all their time on social media and uh, looking for the next like on TikTok or whatever it is. Or we speak dismissively of another celebrity marriage that has gone down the pan. Or another immoral law that has been uh, made in society. But whilst we may criticised to some extent. Verse 2 says we should show humility, to be gentle, to be peaceable to people, not to mock, not to scoff, not to look down on others in society. And the reason we're to be like that is verse 3. He says, for we ourselves were also once foolish disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You see the logic? Speak well of people on the outside. Speak well of those in society. Be humble towards them, for we were once like that. The reason that we're to be like verses 1 and 2 is found in verse 3, because we ourselves were once like that. There's no place for tribalism here. No place on looking down on other people in society. We know better. There's no sort of us and them, as it were. And in fact, even now as Christians, we may look for uh, love or happiness or pleasure or whatever it looks like in verse 3 in the same places as people in society. Perhaps we're not even better now, but certainly we were no better before we became Christians. We were doing the same thing, Paul says. There's no sort of us and them. We're human beings with human desires. There's no place for pride here, Paul says. And so one application for us as a church is, are we a bit like Sainsbury's? Is our public face that we're sort of warm and friendly and we, we want people to come in, but actually behind the scenes, we sort of scoff at those in the world. We look down at those who live a lifestyle very different to ours. Do we think that we're better than them in some way? Or in our language, do we reflect that just like the drunk on the street on a Saturday night, just like the woman sleeping around for connection and meaning, just like the drug addict or whatever it looks like, just like all of those people, we too were once like that. That we too are human beings looking for meaning, satisfaction and desire. 
There's no room to look down on other people, Paul says. We too were once like that. Paul's reminder to us. But that brings us on to the next point. God's rescue. That's particularly verses 4 to 7. God's rescue. He says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now that is a pretty dense paragraph, isn't it? There's a lot of information. This is the wonderful gospel that Paul reminds us of. Uh, We're going to think about three questions to sort of unpack uh, those verses. Uh, First of all, why were we rescued? You can see that in verses 4 and 5. Why were we rescued? Well, it says... We were rescued when the kindness and love of God appeared. Just like last week, it is all of God's grace. The grace of God appeared, 2 verse 11. Now he says, the loving kindness of God came. That's why we've been rescued, because of God's kindness, his mercy. Verse 5 says, not by works of righteousness that we have done. It's not by those things that he has saved us. Isn't that a common misconception about what Christianity is about? Have you ever heard that? You know, Christianity is about sort of being a good person, living a good life, perhaps getting to heaven by your good deeds. It's a very common misconception that people have of what it means to be a Christian. Verse 5 is really important. If you like underlining things in your Bible, verse 5 is a really important verse for us to have in our armory. He has saved us not by the works of our righteousness, not by the good things that we have done. It's not by that, but it's by his love, his kindness that he has saved us. We don't come to God by our own merits, but the merits of Jesus. The grace of God has appeared, 2 verse 11. So why are we rescued? Not because of our own goodness, but because of God's mercy. How were we rescued? Well, we can see that in verses 5 to 6. We were rescued through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. You can see in verse 4, God the Father. In verse 6, God the Son. And in verse 5, God the Holy Spirit. All three persons of the Trinity working inseparably together for our salvation. Now, if I were to ask you, and I'm not going to ask you, but if I were to ask you, what is the gospel... And what is the good news of Christianity? Perhaps you would say, God so loved the world, he gave his son. It's about Jesus, the son, dying on the cross for our sins. Something like that. Would you mention the Holy Spirit? If I was to say, what is the gospel? Would you mention the Spirit? Well, verse 5, the Holy Spirit is intimately connected in the work of the gospel. The Holy Spirit's job is to apply the work of the gospel, amongst many other things, particularly, verse 5, the regeneration and renewing. Regeneration and renewal is the work of the Spirit in the gospel. This is referring to the regeneration, means the new birth, being born again. Jesus says in John 3, you need to be born again by the Spirit. By faith in Jesus, the Spirit comes to live in our hearts. He gives us new spiritual life. He uh, makes us born again, regenerated, so that we can know God, have uh, sins forgiven and all of that, and then an ongoing change in our lives. That's the renewal. That's what is called sanctification, our change, our growth in holiness. The work of the Spirit is to apply to us the work of Christ. Christ outside of us has died and uh, risen again for our sins, and the Spirit applies that on the inside. He applies that to us. That's why it actually says, verse 6, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus. The Son sends his Spirit to us to transform us day by day, to apply the work of the gospel to us. Now, do you remember last week, uh, our friend, this chap, uh, John uh, Chrysostom, the golden mouth preacher? Some of you obviously don't. Um, he's one of my favorites. Um, he says something very helpful about the passage last week. He says something very helpful about this passage as well. He says this. He says, as when a house 
is in a ruinous state. No one places props under it, nor makes any addition to the old building, but pulls it down to its foundations and rebuilds it anew. So in our case, God has not repaired us, but made us anew. In other words, imagine a house that's boarded up. The roof has collapsed. The floor is sort of missing. The walls are crumbling down. What do you do to a house like that? What do you do? Well, you don't put a bit of paint on the wall. You don't put the carpet down. You don't do some uh, regrouting in the bathroom. You don't do those things. You tear it down and you start again. You tear it down. Verse 3 says, the state that we were in, the house that we were in, was in a state. It was verse 3. What does God do? He recreates. He regenerates us. He gives us a new life, a new spiritual life, not a top-up. It's not that we were fine and then sort of God's grace adds a bit of top-up to get us all the way to God. No, no, no. A whole new life. A whole new state, being born again, new spiritual life through the Spirit. We needed to be made anew. That's how we were rescued, through the work of the Spirit, applying the gospel to us. What's the goal of being rescued? Verse 7. Having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We have new life in the spirit now and one day eternal life to be with God forever. We will be heirs of God. We will inherit from him. We are his children now, his sons, his daughters. Jesus calls us his brothers and sisters. We are part of God's family now. We will inherit all things and go to be with him forever. That's the goal. That's the end point. That's, that's the thing that it's all moving towards is verse 7, the hope of eternal life. Now, if you're really eagle-eyed, you will perhaps notice, I'll be very impressed if you have noticed, there is something missing in this gospel presentation. This summary of the gospel that the Apostle Paul makes, there is something which is missing. Verse 7, we might expect to say, having been justified by faith, we should become heirs. Often the Apostle Paul will talk about being justified by faith, There is no mention here of our response to the gospel. There's no mention of us receiving it by faith. Now, that's not because Paul didn't believe that. You can see elsewhere, it clearly does believe that. It is important that we receive God's rescue by faith. The reason that Paul has not mentioned our response here is the whole emphasis on what God has done. All of the emphasis here is on what God has done. It is his rescue. It is his work. It is all of his grace in salvation. He has rescued us. Why are we told this? We're told this as a reason to obey, verses 1 and 2. We're to obey, to speak well of people, because we're no better. We're the same. We've been rescued. Rescued by his grace. Not because of our own goodness, but all because of the mercy of God. That's why we obey. So God's rescue. Thirdly, finally, our response. Our response. Our response is verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable uh, to men. Now, a few times in Paul's letters to Timothy, one or two Timothy and Titus, he mentions this is a faithful saying. This is a faithful, trustworthy saying. And every time that he does mention that, it's somehow tied into the gospel. The faithful sayings are tied into the work of Jesus, work of the gospel. In other words, the stuff that he's just said of God rescuing us is a faithful and reliable saying. You can be sure and trust the fact that God rescues undeserving people. It is a faithful saying, he says. And it's a faithful, amazing truth 
that is to be lived out. It is to be lived out, verse 8, by good works. The elders, Titus and the others, are to affirm or insist upon these things, that these things is the gospel, the doctrine that is to be lived out, but of course it's a doctrine that leads to godliness. We saw right back in chapter 1, verse 1, the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. The truth of the gospel produces in us a desire, a wanting to live for him, to live out God's grace, and particularly to live out God's grace by our good works. That's what verse 8 says, that we should be careful to maintain good works. Isn't it interesting that here in this passage, verse 5 says we're not saved by our good works, we are saved for good works. It's quite clear. It's not that our good works get us to God. They don't get us to heaven, verse 5. It's not by works of righteousness. But verse 8 says we are to live out that faith by good works. Good works are really important. They don't get us saved, but they are the fruit of salvation. In fact, verse 8 says they're a benefit to people. They're a blessing to people. They are good for people, good and profitable for men and women. They don't profit us in a salvation sense, but they are profitable for other people. Martin Luther said, God doesn't need your good works, but your neighbor does. It's true. God doesn't need them, but our neighbor needs them. And so as we close, Swindon Evangelical Church is to commit itself to good works, not to be right with God, but to be a blessing to others. Now, we'll think about what that means next week a little bit more because the final section in Titus is all about good works. But remember the context of our passage. Some of the good works must be the way that we interact with outsiders, the way that we engage with the authorities, speaking well of people, being gentle, being peaceful, being good citizens. The good works in this passage must be in the context of that, especially if you look at verse 8. It talks about being profitable to, to, to men or to people. Or verse 2 as well says, showing humility to, to men or to people. Verse 1 talks about being ready for every good work. And verse 8 talks about maintaining good works. They're linked together. The good works that Paul has in mind here is the way that we interact with society the way that we interact with the world around us, the culture around us, particularly those who are in leadership. Our speech, our conduct, our attitude is to be one that is gracious, that is kind. A gentle, humble disposition towards our boss, for example. The way that we discipline our children is to be gentle. Uh, the peaceable way the peaceful way that we perhaps speak to a family member or to a spouse, bringing peace, not conflict. The friendly demeanour that we have towards a shop assistant, the compassion with which we speak about others, even if their lifestyle is one that we're really concerned about. The list goes on. You can think about those applications. But it's as we remember God's mercy, as we remember his loving kindness, the fact that he has rescued us. We're no better, verse 3 says, We've been rescued not because we're good, but all because of his grace. And in response to that, we commit ourselves to good works. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you do not need our good works. We thank you that there is nothing that we could ever do to make us right before you. Thank you that it is entirely of what Jesus has done for us. Thank you that if we trust in him, we have this regeneration, this new birth through the Spirit. We're being renewed and being changed by him day by day. And we have this wonderful hope of eternal life. Help us as we think about that, as we think about that we too have once lived lives which were not pleasing to you. Help us to be humble towards others. Help us to be gentle, to speak well, and to commit ourselves to good works. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.